In this lecture, we are going to cover transfer functions. Transfer functions are one of the most important topics in control systems, if not the most important one. We will use it throughout the entire course. A transfer function gives a displicit relationship between the input and an output of a system. And as we can imagine, this is very useful when we want to control a given mechanical or electrical system. We apply an input to that system to the model described by a transfer function and we can calculate the output, that is, how the system responds to that command. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to understand the concepts of transfer functions, find the transfer function of a given system, and find the temporal response of a system for a given input. By temporal response, we mean a function of time that describes the output of a given system for a certain input command. To find the temporal response, we have to use four steps. The first step consists of finding a model in the temporal domain. That is a differential equation that describes the behavior of a given system. We then take the Laplace transform of that system and find a model, but now in the S domain, the Laplace domain. Once you know the model in the S domain, we are able to give the system an input using one of the forcing signals that we covered in lecture three. Then, by taking the inverse Laplace transform, we finally find the temporal response, which describes the evolution in time of a given variable in the system, consider for instance the position of a mechanical system over time. There are many applications of transfer function. Consider this example. Here we have a system of two masses connected by a series of springs and dampers. Consider that a spring K3 is stretched by five millimeters, held and then released. If we have a transfer function, we can now calculate how the position of mass M1 or M2 evolve in time when the mass is released from rest. In this case, the input to the system will be the position x of s, which is the Laplace transform of x of t. This will be given to a function of s, which is our transfer function, and the output of that transfer function is the variable of interest, which could be the displacement of mass m2, or the displacement of mass m1, or even the speed or acceleration of each mass. Consider also this robotic arm. Through a transfer function, we can determine what torque must be applied to each joint in order to make the tip of the robot move from point A to point B. To answer that question, we need to find a comprehensive model of the robot and the transfer functions that will now convert that voltage into a displacement. We can combine many transfer functions. For example, we can start by finding a relation between the applied voltage to a given motor and the output torque of that motor. Let's call this transfer function H1 of S. The torque, once applied to a mechanical system, creates a acceleration. Through transfer function X2, we can now take the angular displacement of each joint. We can now give the angular position of each joint to the kinematic structure of this robot through another function H3 of S, and this results in the tip position of the robot. If now we want relation between voltage and position, we can simply write voltage position as the input and output, and our new transfer function now is simply a combination of these small transfer functions, h1 times h2 times h3. Our job now consists in finding h1, h2, and h3, defining an input signal that is a voltage that is applied to each motor, and then see what the position in the output is. Let's get started with an example. The transfer function is simply the relation between the input and output, divided as a function in the Laplace domain. In this form, let's call h of s a transfer function. The transfer function would be always defined as the output divided by the input of a given system. Let's apply this to the mass spring damper system here. As we saw in lecture 2, we can find a differential equation that governs the displacement of the mass when a force x of t is applied to it. By doing the sum of forces equals to the mass times the acceleration, we came up with this expression, a second order differential equation, again covered in lecture two. This is step one. To find the transfer function, now we need to take the Laplace transform of this equation. The Laplace transform of m times the second derivative of x is m, the second derivative is s squared, and x of t becomes x of s. So again here, x is squared, denotes the second derivative of x of s. Laplace transform of b is b, and the Laplace transform of the first derivative of x with respect to time is s times x of s. k is k, and x becomes x of s. f of t, the forcing term, becomes f of s. We can now factor x of s on the left side of the equation 
and now apply the definition of a transfer function that is the output divided by the input. The output here is the displacement, and the input is the force f of s or f of t. To put this equation in a transfer function form, thus we need x over f, and that is given by 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k. And this is the transfer function between the input and the output. Now to find the displacement when a force is applied in the temp pro domain, we now need to define what f of s is, if it's a step input, a impulse, a sinusoidal waveform, and so on. Then move f of s once defined to the other side of the equation and find the inverse Laplace transform of x of s, that is x of t, and that is the output of the system provided that f of s is applied to it. Let's do one more example. We have the same mass spring damper system, the same input f of t, but now let's assume that the output is the velocity of mass, that is v of t, which is simply the derivative of x of t. v of t is now the variable of interest, so that the dynamic model needs to be written as a function of v. Let's start by creating a free body diagram of m. The force is applied to the right, which means that the spring and the damper will resist motion and apply a force to the left. The force applied by the damper is proportional to the viscous friction coefficient b times the velocity. The velocity in this case is v. So here we have b times v. The force applied by the spring is given by the, dis the displacement of the spring times the stiffness constant k. That would be k times x. In this example we are not dealing with x, we are dealing with velocity. So to go from velocity to displacement we now need to integrate the velocity. This means that the force developing the spring is the stiffness constant times the displacement, that is the integral of v of t dt. Now the problem is easy. We do the sum of forces equals to the mass times acceleration as a function of position, that is x double dot, but as a function of velocity, that is v dot, the derivative of velocity. Let's assume that the mass moves to the left Let's assume that the mass moves to the right, so all forces going to the right are positive. The sum of forces now gives negative k integral of v dt minus bv plus f of t equals to mv dot. If we now rearrange this equation, we have mv dot plus bv plus k integral of v dt equals to f of t. Now let's take the Laplace transform of equation 2. The Laplace transform of m times v dot, m is m, and v dot is s times v of s. v of t becomes v of s, and s indicates the derivative of v in the frequency domain. The Laplace transform of b is simply b, and v of t now becomes v of s plus k, the integral of v, is denoted by v of s over s. v of t becomes v of s and the integral is denoted by 1 over s. And this is equal to f of t, which becomes f of s. We can now factor out v of s and further rearrange this expression by finding a common denominator, which is s. And now we are ready to find the transfer function. The transfer function is defined as the output divided by the input. The output is v, the velocity. The input is f, the force. Now to write the blue expression in the standard form of a transfer function, we need the output divided by the input. So we need to invert what we have there. And this gives s over ms squared plus bs plus k. Now notice something interesting. The transfer function between the displacement and the force in the previous slide was given by 1 over ms squared plus ps plus k. Do you see any similarities between these two? They are almost the same, but the velocity transfer function has this s on top. What does that represent? In the frequency domain, we know that a s represents the derivative. Notice that the speed transfer function is the position transfer function times s. We take the position transfer function, we multiply by that by s. Question, what would be the transfer function between the acceleration of the mass and the input force? Think about it. If from position 
we can rewrite the entire expressions as a function of acceleration. In that case, I would have to integrate the position twice to find the displacement and calculate the spring force, integrate the acceleration once to find the speed and calculate the damper force, and so on. Or we could simply realize that to go from position to, uh, to speed, we multiply the transfer function by s. If you now take the position transfer function and multiply that by s again, we are taking the derivative of the transfer function one more time. The derivative of v is a, that's the acceleration. And this would simply become s squared over a mass squared plus b s plus k. Another example here. In this example, the voltage is the input and the output is the current. The transfer function is thus given by the output in the frequency domain divided by the input. This is a simple LR circuit, and through Kirchhoff's law, we can now find the relation between voltage and current through equation 4. Now let's take the Laplace transform of equation 4. V of t becomes V of s. R is a constant that doesn't change. I of t is I of s plus L times the derivative of I of t is s times I of s. Now factoring I of s gives the following expression. And now we can put this expression in the standard form of a transfer function that is I over V, which is one over LS plus R. Input output relationship expressed in the frequency domain. And let's do another example. We have the same circuit, but now the output of our circuit is the voltage across the inductor, not the current. The input is still V of T. Through Kirchhoff's law, we find the first relation between V and I. The output of our system is simply the voltage across the inductor. We know that the voltage across the inductor is L times the derivative of the current, which is given here. If the input is V and the output is VL, the transfer function needs to be written as VL of S over V of S, output divided by the input. From the previous example, we can follow the same steps to find the first transfer function between I and V. And this is the same transfer function we had before. This is not the transfer function we want in this case because the output is no longer I, but VL. We now need a relation between I and VL. And that is the second expression we just created given here. The Laplace transform of that is VL of S equals to L times IS. I of S is VL of S divided by LS. We can now take this expression and replace I of S in the original transfer function. Now we have VL of S over LS times 1 over VS equals to 1 over LS plus R. Now rearranging the equation, multiplying both sides by LS, we have LS over LS plus R. And this is now the transfer function between the output VL and the input V. Notice that in this process, to go from the transfer function between the current and the voltage, we simply multiply the transfer function by LS. Multiplying that by LS means that you're taking the derivative of the current and multiplying that by L, which is indeed the voltage across the inductor. Now let's consider another example. In this example, we have a simple pendulum. The input to this system is the torque applied at the pivot point and the output is the position theta of t with respect to the horizontal axis. The sum of torques around the pivot point gives expression 6. We see that this expression is not linear. We now need to make an approximation and linearize the system. Assuming that the system always operates around 0, we can say that if theta tends to 0, sine of theta is approximately theta. And I will replace this with theta of t. The transfer function is the output divided by the input, that is theta over a, theta of s divided by t of s. Now let's take the Laplace transform of equation 6 and it remains m. The second derivative of theta of t becomes s squared theta of s. mg over l is a constant, it doesn't change. And theta of t now becomes theta of s. t of t becomes t of s. Now we can factor out theta s 
And I'll write this expression as t theta over t, that is simply 1 over ms squared plus mg over l. Now that I have seen some examples, let us define more formally what a transfer function is and what poles and zeros of that transfer function are. A transfer function is a rational function in a complex variable s in the Laplace domain, where s is sigma plus j omega. s thus has a real and imaginary component. Let's call the numerator of the transfer function n of s, which is simply a polynomial of s with coefficients b, n. And the denominator of that function, let's call it d of s, also a polynomial of s, whose coefficients are a, n. The zeros of the transfer function are the roots of n of s equals to zero. That is the values of s that make equation eight tend to zero. Because the numerator goes to zero, the entire function goes to zero. The poles of the transfer function are the roots of the denominator, that is d of s equals to zero. The values of s that satisfy d of s equals to zero are called the poles of the transfer function. When the denominator goes to zero, or when s tends to the pole p, then the transfer function h of s tends to infinity. Consider the following transfer function. s times s plus 3 divided by s squared plus s plus 5. The poles are the values of s that make the denominator 0. By solving for s squared plus 2s plus 5 equals to 0, we find s equals to minus 1 plus minus 2j. These are the two poles of the transfer function. And as we see on the graph on the right, when s tends to a pole, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to infinity. The zeros are the values of the transfer function that make the numerator 0. That is s equals to 0 and s plus 3 equals to 0, which gives s equals to negative 3. And when you look at the magnitude of the transfer function as shown on in the right, we see that at the zeros, the magnitude of the transfer function tends to 0. Because they are only concerned with maxima and minima of this transfer function, we only care about poles and zeros. Every other value on this three-dimensional graph have no purpose for our analysis. Thus, we can convert this three-dimensional graph into a 2D graph, as shown on the left, and only locate poles and zeros. This is the imaginary plane. The real axis represents the value of sigma, the imaginary axis represents the values of omega. And I'll locate poles and zeros on that two-dimensional plane. Poles will be indicated by a cross or an X, and the zeros will be indicated by a circle or a dot. Let's continue on our formal definition of transfer functions. We can now define the order of a transfer function. The order is the number of the highest derivative in the denominator, the highest power of s. Let's consider a first order transfer function. A first order transfer function is given as g of s, k which is a constant times 1 over tau s plus 1. This is the standard form. In this standard form, k is simply a gain and tau is what we call the time constant of the system. Let's go back to our circuit where the transfer function was 1 over ls plus r. We see that this transfer function is not in the standard form because we have plus r instead of plus 1 in the denominator. To put this now in the standard form, we need to divide, we need to divide the top and the bottom of the equation by r. The top now becomes 1 over r and the bottom becomes l over r times s plus 1. This is now the standard form of a first order transfer function. 1 over r is k and l over r is tau. s is to the power of 1 and this, is, this characterizes a first order transfer function. Tau is what we call the time constant. It characterizes the response to a step input of a first order system. It gives an idea of how fast the system is before it stabilizes or reaches a certain value. To find tau, the time constant, the denominator must be in the form of tau s plus 1. We will come back to these definitions later. Now let's look at a second order transfer function. For a second order transfer function, the maximum power of the denominator is 2. And here we need to introduce some new concepts. Notice how the, the equation is written. Omega n squared divided by s squared times 1 plus 2 zeta omega n times s plus omega n squared. 
Omega n is what we call the natural frequency of the system, and zeta is the damping ratio. We'll come back to these definitions in the next lecture, but it's a good idea to get familiar with this notation. Let's take our mass spring damper system and try to write that in the standard form. The transfer function h of s, which is the output x divided by the input f, is given by 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k. This is not in a standard form because f is multiplied by m, whereas in the standard form s is multiplied by 1. To get rid of that m, we need to divide the denominator and the numerator by m. This gives 1 over m divided by s squared plus b over m s plus k over m. We're getting close to the standard form, but now notice that it, in equation 12, we have omega n squared in the denominator and omega n squared in the numerator. Whereas in the transfer function, we only have 1 over m. We need k to appear in the numerator. To do that, let's multiply the equation by k and also divide the equation by k. Now we see that these two terms are the same. S is multiplied by 1. We can now compare these two forms and define the damping ratio and the natural frequency. Omega n squared equals to k over m. The natural frequency is square root of k over m. 2 zeta omega n is the term that multiplies s, and what multiplies s here is b over m. So 2 zeta omega n equals to b over m. Omega n is given as the square root of k over m. And after some simple manipulation, we find the damping ratio as b over 2 times the square root of m times k. We'll come back to these definitions in, in lecture 5. Now let's move on to the next step towards finding the temporal response of a given system. Let's consider again our mass spring damper system where the input was a force f of t. When looking for the response of that system to a given input, one needs to define what the input is. Consider, for instance, a step input given in the second graph. A force step input, for instance, would be equivalent to apply a certain force to the system and hold that force constant over time. If the magnitude of that force is a, then r of t, or f of t, the input, is f of t equals 2a, and its Laplace transform is a times 1 over s. Talking about an impulse, for instance, if you just let the system go from rest, or if an initial condition needs to be forced into the system, then an impulse in the time domain is simply given by delta of t in the frequency domain r of s equals to 1. A ramp input is, for example, a force that continuously increases over time, linearly. In that case, the input is given by a times t, where a is a constant. The Laplace transform of that is a times 1 over s squared. These are some forcing signals but there are more. We can also apply a polynomial input for the mass spring damper system. That would mean that the force increases exponentially over time, or the voltage applied to the circuit increases exponentially over time. And here we have the equivalent in the frequency domain. A is a constant again. A sine or a cosine waveform can also be applied. The next step towards finding the temporal response is to now apply one of these forcing signals to a transfer function. Let's consider again our mass spring damper system. Equation 13 gives the transfer function we calculated. That is the relation between the output displacement, x, and the input force, f. Now to find the temporal response, we need to multiply both sides of this equation by f of s, that is simply moving f of s to the right side of the equation, and replacing f of s with the appropriate signal. If f of t is an impulse, then f of s is equal to 1. And this is now, and this is now the variable x of s for that given input. To find x of t, we simply take the inverse Laplace transform of x of s. And this now gives the temporal response for that given input. Let's now consider a different input. In this time, we have a step type input. f of t is equal to 1 newton. This means that at time equal to zero, a force of one newton is applied to the mass, and that force is held constant as time tends to infinity. The Laplace transform of a step is 1 over s times the magnitude. In this case, the magnitude is 1. So now x of s becomes 1 over ms squared plus bs plus k times the input. The input in this case is 1 over s. If you're now looking for x of t, x of t is simply 
the inverse Laplace transform of x of s, and this gives the temporal response of x of t, that is how x, how the position changes over time when a step force is applied to the mass. In the last example, the input now is a sinusoidal wave form f of t equals to 5 times sine of t newtons. So the force now changes over time, the magnitude follows a sinusoidal wave form. The Laplace transform of sine of t is 1 over s squared plus 1, and the Laplace transform of 5 is simply 5. So 5 sine of t is 5 divided by s squared plus 1. Now by multiplying the transfer function by the input, we get f x of s. The inverse Laplace of 16 gives x of t, that is the position of the mass as a function of time when a force that follows a sinusoidal wave form is applied to the mass. In step 3, once we have applied the input, we now take the inverse Laplace transform. This is what we discussed in the previous slides. Let's consider equation 18. This is the result when a step input is applied to the mass spring damper system. Now to find x of t, that is the solution to the initial differential equation, or the time response of the mass for, a, for the step input, now take the inverse Laplace transform of the transfer function times the appropriate input. And depending on the values of m, b, and k, we will see one of these curves. This is only valid for a step input. The mass first oscillates and then eventually settles at a given value, or will reach that value following an exponential curve. Which one will occur? Well, this depends now on the values of m, b, and k. This depends on the location of the poles, because as we saw in lecture 3, the location of poles give the combinations of exponential and sinusoidal waveforms necessary to recreate a function x of t, that is a solution to the differential equation that governs this system. Here we can identify two separate stages in that temporal response. The first one is the transient. The transient is a period in which the mass is still moving before it settles. Once it settles, we call that value steady state. Once the output doesn't change anymore, we say that the system has reached steady state. Before the system reaches a steady state, the system has a transient response. We are going to deal with the transient response and the steady state response separately. But for now, let's assume that the steady state response is sufficient. The steady state value is often referred to as the final value. And if you want to calculate the final value of the system only, that is, when you apply a force, where is the final position of the mass, where does it settle, we don't necessarily need to take the inverse Laplace transform. If you're only looking for the final value or the steady state value of the system, we can apply the final value theorem. The final value theorem states that if a function converges, that is, it reaches a steady state, and the condition for that, as we'll see later, is that the poles of the transfer function have negative real parts, then the final value, which is given by the limit when time tends to infinity of x of t, time is tending to infinity, and the function is settling at a given point. Let's call this point steady state value. The steady state value is simply obtained by taking the limit of this function x of t when time tends to infinity. This would require the inverse Laplace transform, but there is a theorem that states that this value is equivalent to the limit of x of s times s when s tends to zero. Now you can see that this has many advantages. One doesn't need to calculate the inverse Laplace x of t to find the value, final value. Simply take the expression x of s, multiply that by s, and make s tend to zero. Going back to the mass spring damper system, in the case of a step input, this is the expression we defined for x of s. Now to find the final position of the mass, we can take the inverse Laplace of x of s and make time tend to infinity, or simply take x of s, multiply that by s, and now find the limit of the resulting function when s tends to zero. In that case, 1 over s cancels with this s, and when s tends to zero, we are left with 1 over k. This makes perfect sense if you apply a force of 1 newton, and the spring has a stiffness constant of 2 newton per meter, it will eventually move by 0.5 meters. The final value does not depend on the dynamics, hence all functions of s that remain in the theorem tend to zero.
Now let's take another example. If you consider the RL system, when the impulse input is given, that is V of S equals to one, we now take the transfer function, multiply that by one, which is the input. The theorem states that we now multiply that by S, make S tend to zero and find the limit. The limit here is zero. This makes sense. Consider again the RL circuit and that there is an initial current flowing through it. The impulse response means that the voltage is set to zero and the system is let go with the initial current I0. The final value of the current in the system will eventually die to zero. And this is what we find here. The concept of transfer functions is not very complicated. We'll come back to them in almost every lecture. Now let's go over a few exercises of transfer functions. I recommend you attempt these exercises on your own and then check the solutions. The solutions will be posted in separate videos. Thank you.